like that there were moments where I saw the way women were treated or even myself being a woman, even in uniform, where it really hits you in the heart when you, you know you're nothing because you're a woman. That's their impression kind of thing. And so, yeah, there were a few moments where it was seeing that and you can't do anything about it either. Hi, I'm Shannon Busta, and you're listening to For Her Country, a podcast produced by the True Patriot Love Foundation and the Captain Nicola Goddard Fund. Over the course of this series, we'll explore lessons in leadership from inspirational female leaders from across Canada's armed forces, all in honor of fallen Canadian military hero, Captain Nicola Goddard. I can't believe it, but this is the final episode of season two of For Her Country. It has been a journey, and we hope that you have enjoyed these conversations as much as we have. And perhaps if you came to this podcast without much military knowledge, as I did, we hope you've learned some interesting things about the Canadian Armed Forces and the amazing women who are leading change across the organization. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with retired Master Corporal Natalie Forcier. Natalie served in the Canadian Armed Forces as a medical technician from 2002 to 2016. She grew up in a small rural French community in northern Saskatchewan and knew she wanted to step outside of her comfort zone, which is why she joined the military just after graduating from high school. Natalie has been posted to Winnipeg, Manitoba, Trenton, Ontario, She has deployed to Afghanistan in 2008 and 2010, and Libya in 2011. Natalie struggled with the transition from military to civilian life, but she was fortunate enough to be introduced to the True Patriot Love All Women's Expedition to Baffin Island. Natalie and a group of veteran women and business leaders trekked through the Arctic together to raise funds and learn from each other. That expedition ended up changing the course of Natalie's life, and I can't wait for you to hear her story. It's so good to be connected, Natalie. Thank you so much for being generous with your time and joining us on the show today. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm really honored to do this for TPL and for other female veterans. And we're so happy to have you. So I'd like to start off our conversation today as I often do on the show. And that's by asking how you found your way into a career in the military. Uh, Well, I grew up in a very small French community in northern Saskatchewan. And for me, the military was a way to travel, get a, a bit of an adventure as well as serve my country. And it was kind of one of those, it was, it was sexy kind of thing. So for me, I was like, okay, well, I don't, I don't know what I want to do if I went to university and I don't want to be uh, loaded with student debt. So I just thought, you know what, I'll just see where this leads me. And it ended up, I ended up serving almost 14 years in the military. So I, I loved it. It grew on me and it changed me being from such a small town to uh, to a big city like Montreal for basic training and like I had never called a cab before or ordered pizza online or over the phone kind of thing so it was more just that adventure and and seeing the world that's pretty wild to think about I mean what a transition and how old were you when you enlisted uh, when I when I like signed the dotted line I would just turned 18 so wow I'm just so yeah high school. Yeah. And what was your family's reaction to your choice to enlist? Uh, well, initially, I, I like I didn't say too much to my family. My older sister, who was already in university in Saskatoon, um, would take me to the recruiting center. I thought my family or my parents at least would um, be less likely to be supportive of me joining the military. But when I told them, they were all super happy and excited for me. And And I was like, oh, okay. So I stressed for no reason kind of thing. And I remember when I'd reached my 10 years uh, having served in the military, I called my parents and I was like, oh, you know, 10 years today. And they were like, wow, we were, we were surprised you would do two weeks. Like we didn't, we didn't think you'd be able to survive two weeks. So we're like, yeah, go ahead. (laughs) 
So I was like, oh, okay, that's why there was the support, you know? So, but they're like always telling me how proud they are of me and stuff. So it, it, it was definitely um, a great thing that I don't ever regret. So that must have been a bit of a surprise for them when you didn't come home midway through basic training. And what element did you end up choosing? So I chose, I was an Air Force element and, and I chose really um, naively because I didn't really understand the full scope of what I was getting into because they had asked like, what color uniform do you want to wear? And I was like, well, what, what are my choices? <laughs> and they're like green, blue, or or black and I was like well blue for you know just I don't know if it was a style thing but I had I just chose by the color and so when I the day I was sworn in I they told me I was Air Force and I was like oh I thought the Navy uniform is really cool and they're like you said a blue uniform (laughs) so I was like oh okay gotcha and I ended up (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I ended up like on my platoon when I got to basic training, there was four other medics and they were all army. And they were like, Oh my god, how did you get Air Force? They told me it was, you know, they had, they weren't taking any more Air Force medics. Um, and I was like, No, <laughs> this is not a story. Uh, I need to share with you how I managed to get Air Force. And can you take us with you to basic training? What was that experience actually like? Oh, wow. Well, for me, like I grew up in a very small town of 100 people um, and I hadn't traveled a lot before joining the military. So like the mega is this massive, monstrous, like cement building with we had like a little tiny cubicle to, our, to ourselves. It was open. It was just like a four foot wall between all our bed spaces. Um, and we lived up on the ninth floor so it was traveling stairs every day um kind of just that increased stress of like a schedule um you know our gym classes after gym class you had like 10 minutes to shower and get back in line so for for women especially 10 minutes for a shower and get ready is is near impossible right but like for me, I was 18 at the time and the median age of our platoon was 35. So I was very much the baby, but I found the majority of the older people on my platoon, they were like parents or comrades. We worked as a team really well throughout our basic training. So my basic training experience, if I could do the exact same experience with the same people I do it again I really enjoyed it but you constantly work as a team so it's never just the you right and you mentioned that pretty early on you found yourself in the role of a medic how did that process unfold for you well to like prior to even um, being sworn in you select uh, what trades you're interested in and then there's a selection process like a, a an interview with a military career counselor and then a a medical and then an aptitude test. So the Canadian forces aptitude test will test different, um, like your spatial ability, verbal and stuff like that. So it'll kind of give them a guide of what trades you'd be good at. Initially infantry to me seemed like the coolest job ever. (laughs) And the recruiter was like, well, there's no women in the military. So I was like, okay, well, maybe maybe there's a reason for that. But the medical part, like helping people, for me, was something that I knew I was good at. I knew that it was something that I don't, I don't have to struggle to care for people. Like I grew up with five of the, five of their siblings, and I'm one of the, uh, the second eldest. So there was always that being able to care. So for me, I was like, well, why not? And so after basic training, I got sent to Borden for a few months where they put you on PAP platoon. And PAP platoon is personnel awaiting training. So it's very much, you're not qualified yet. So you'd end up doing just little Joe jobs, like moving furniture. Like I had done some training with the military police for their courses. So we were actors for some of their testing. And so you get these little Joe jobs. Some are great, some are like not so great. But come end of May of 2002, I went out to BC where I started the medical training. Um, so they call it like QL3s 
So your qualification level three, which is a, your basic medical training, which was comprised of three months in BC doing a paramedic course, and then back to board in for another three months to do more nursing skills, learning your anatomy, physiology, and then your basic medical exams. And then a few years later, then you go, I went back for an upgrade where I did my QL5s, where there's just more responsibility. Um, your scope of practice is a lot larger. You're considered more of an independent medic after that. So if there's tasking or training where there's no doctors, they'll send a medic. Uh, yeah. And then a few years after that, upgrade again. So that's kind of the way of the military because there's always a want to grow at least for me. Yes, absolutely. We've actually heard that from a number of our guests on the show. The values of continuous improvement in the military are part of what makes it so attractive for so many people. So you've given us a brief timeline of your medical training. Could you give us a brief timeline of your career? Oh, geez, brief? <laughs> oh, God. Well, uh, sure. I, so I joined in 2002, um, and then I completed basic training in February 2003. Yeah, so 10 weeks, sorry. Um, and then once I was done, my PAP platoon did my paramedic training, my course in boarding. Uh, it took another year. So in 2004, February 2004, I was posted to Winnipeg at 23 Health Services. Uh, so it's a very a smaller clinic compared to your big army bases and that's where as a ql3 in a clinic i'd work alongside a doctor and the doctors we had there were phenomenal so you know take us through our training and stuff and teach us hands-on side by side with the doctor and uh anyways while i was in winnipeg I, I had the opportunity to go out to France as a representative of the medical trade or the medical um, corps, Canadian Forces Medical Corps. Um, and we had put a plaque on one of the tanks that had been uncovered, like it was a Canadian tank that had been uncovered on Bimy Ridge and was now in the town centre at Colsey sur mer And so we unveiled the plaque. So I got to fly down there um, as a medic and I was there with another doctor, another reserve medic, um, which was an incredible experience. I was a no hook private. So it was very new and very fresh to the military. So, and it was really inspiring um, to be there and th see the appreciation that um, the French people had for us. Um, and then going to the cemeteries and, and all these things that really um, solidified why I love being in the military. So um, that was while I was in Winnipeg. I also got to work at the recruiting center, which was interesting because you get to see, you know, medical things I wasn't privy to while in the military um, or while at a military clinic. Because like the, as a military medic in a clinic, I, you only see military population. So you never see the elderly or the young. Um, or certain medical conditions that um, aren't allowed in the military. So working at the recruiting center, there's like my medical experience grew from there because I had an incredible PA to teach me. And then that was in 2007. In 2008, I deployed to Afghanistan on Task Force 108. Uh, with Edmonton. So Edmonton was uh, deployed at that time. So I worked at the Roll 3 facility. Um, so the primary care uh, clinic was this giant tent in Kandahar Airfield that would do like primary care for civilians or certain militaries that didn't have a medical clinic to go to. And where I worked specifically, we would um, drive out to the flight line when there was casualties coming in, take them off the choppers, put them in our ambulances and drive them to the Roll 3 surgical uh, facility. So I did that for six months. And, and, and then, am I correct in thinking you were 24 years old at this point? Uh, yeah, at 24. That's a little bit mind blowing for me. What was that experience like for you? You know, I, from a medical perspective, um, 
I saw things that I'd never seen here in Canada and they weren't all bad things. Um, but the, it, I worked at an international medical facility. So we had like British, Australian, uh, Americans, like it was the team we had made it enjoyable and it, it was such a great experience. Like there was some bad days, but um, the people uh, that I got to work with and some of the experiences I got to do while there were worth it, totally worth it. And I know 24 seems super young, but I returned to Afghanistan in 2010 um, with Petawawa and um, I was t turning 26 at the time and I was the third eldest person in our, in our group. There was two or three of the young Newfoundland regiment members that um, dropped out of grade 12 to deploy with us and they were returning after tour to go finish their grade 12 and they were the sweetest sweetest gentlemen ever that that breaks my heart i'm getting emotional just thinking about these young men who are so determined to serve their country yeah to that extent where you're skipping your your grade 12 class yeah 24 actually wasn't that bad <laughs> Uh, after deploying in Trent, like out of Trenton um, to Afghanistan in 2010, I did a couple other upgrade medical courses, but I had injured my knee in 2013, and that led eventually to a medical release in 2016. It sounds like a whirlwind 14 years. Yes. Yes. It was it, it was a whirlwind. It seemed to go by in a flash, though. So, and a lot of the great things I got to see and do and the great people I got to meet or experience crazy things with uh, totally made it worth it. I'd love to go back to your deployments for a bit. What do you think about when you reflect on that time of your life? Oh, wow. So on my second tour in 2010, uh, I lived at Camp Nathan Smith in Kandahar City. It was an old fruit canning factory that um, was now our residence, I guess. Um, so myself and the people I was working with, we would do a lot of, like we call it like VIP taxi or a combat taxi because we'd be chaperoning uh, VIPs or NGOs to uh, facilitate some meetings or say they were building schools or um, whatever projects they were doing to help the communities. Um, so anyways, one of the places we had stopped at was, it was essentially a, a youth detention center. So we were going there and we were looking at how we could help them. And then I asked if I could go on a tour while they were doing their little meeting. So I was allowed to go speak to the girls. And it was probably a, 10 by 20 foot room with like a, a blanket in the corner and there was two girls that were there and one was 11 one was 13 but they were both at the youth detention center one one because she was seen with a boy not doing anything like i was like were you holding hands and she's like no no she was seen with a boy and then the other girl uh, had been married and her husband was abusive so she left and that's where she ended up in a youth detention center. And I thought, and not just for like, here's a month in the youth detention. It was like a year and a half, two years. Oh my God. Yeah. And I thought, oh my God, this is so heartbreaking. Um, like the, there were moments where I saw the way women were treated or even myself being a woman, even in uniform, where it really hits you in the heart when you, you know you're nothing because you're a woman. That's their impression kind of thing. And so, yeah, there were a few moments where it was seeing that and you can't do anything about it either. I, I can't imagine. I mean, just hearing you retell that story is so upsetting. I can't imagine what it must have been like to be there and to still know that you can't do anything. How did you take care of yourself? How were you being kind to yourself in the face of these experiences while you were on deployment? Well, I luckily had a great group of people. So decompressing at the end of the day, um, talking about things that have happened, having a great like support system. Um, and I feel like from 
like the the top to the bottom where I was at when I was on tour in 2010 at Cape Nathan Smith. It was I, I just I had such a great team that it outweighed those moments where it was a struggle. So it definitely um, like there is also most places that you're deployed to will have some way that you can work out. And luckily we had a little gym and we had a few people that were personal trainers that we would, you know, get together and do some mini workouts. So even just that as peer support was invaluable. And what was a shift at the Rural 3 Health Center like for you? Can you walk us through a typical day? Well, uh, well, it depended on the shift. Uh, most day shifts, like you'd get more traffic because it's walking clinic. So you get people coming back from Thailand or you get Americans, you get uh, the kitchen staff from the Philippines who didn't speak a word of English. So all your medical skills are put to the test because you're, you're trying to figure out what's wrong without being able to communicate, um, which happened quite a bit. And so that was typical for daytime. Uh, and then regardless of what shift you were on, it, it, while I was there, there was a high, um, high level of casualties that came in. So a lot of times you get a call saying, you know, the chopper's coming in in five mics. So you got five minutes to be on the airstrip waiting for the flight to come in. And then a lot of times you weren't um, aware of what was going on other than what their priority was. So if they're priority alpha, that means they're in critical condition. So you get like the basic, the most basic of information and then hope to God that you, like the 200 meters that we had from the aircraft to the roll three doors, that you could, uh, that they were gonna make it. So yeah, it was like, you'd enjoy yourself and then there'd be stressful moments, but everybody around you was at the same heightened state where everybody was like focused and you almost, for, well, you pretty much forget about the gore and the blood and the, the, the whatever it is you're looking at, and you focus on saving their lives. It sounds like they were very lucky to have you there. Yeah, it was, uh, it, it was a team. We, we had a great team. <laughs> I was part of the team, but we, we had such an amazing team. It sounds like a pretty high stress job generally, as I'm as I'm sure many jobs in the military are. But looking back on your career now, I'm wondering what the greatest challenge was that you feel you faced. Uh, for me, I think it's a challenge that I still struggle with, I think, because in the military you're you're trained to be very comfortable in the uncomfortable. And everything you do, you're doing as a team, so the you doesn't really matter. So you can set aside your your feelings, your pain, your discomfort or whatever, and just follow through with what you need to do. So you, you put aside your vulnerabilities, you put aside everything um, to follow through with what, like, what the mission is. And so, getting out of the military um it's a totally different um lifestyle and most people you know worry about themselves and then their immediate circle around them but i i spent a lot of my career where i was this happy you know happy person that could always get through stuff and there was never a struggle kind of thing but after like my first and second deployment i struggled with depression and anxiety but everybody knew me as this happy go lucky person kind of thing so um for me the challenge was to accept my vulnerabilities assess them figure out what they are and and grow from there from what i've been told by my psychiatrist and just learning more about um about mental health there's um like you're you're in a heightened state of stress for six to nine months, and although you get comfortable at a high stress level, you're constantly um, 
potentially moments away from massive tragedy, right? So you become accustomed in that heightened state of stress. And it's not always feasible to just dial it back down when you're back in Canada. So, and everybody, I think, experiences it much differently. And something I hear a lot and that I'm um, guilty of doing too is, is always thinking that everybody, everybody else had it worse or most people or somebody else had it worse. So it's not that bad. I can take care of myself and just follow through, get the, the mission done and put the discomfort aside. I'm Catherine Rust. Captain Nicola Goddard was my sister, and I'd like to make a request. Military service can bring great challenges and sacrifices. Women in particular can face unique issues. Help True Patriot Love and the Captain Nicola Goddard Fund support Canada service women, veteran women, and their families. True Patriot Love Foundation is a national organization that supports the military and veteran community by funding critical programs across the country. Please consider donating today towards their mission at tplgoddardfund.com. No donation is too small. On behalf of my family and the Captain Nicola Goddard Fund, we thank you for your support. And thank you so much for opening up and sharing your story and, and being willing to be vulnerable with us. I'm curious what it was like for you when you did come home and suddenly you were not a moment away from potential disaster or tragedy. How was that transition for you? Uh, you know, I, for me, my transition back to reality or back to civilian or Canada, I remember like when I woke up uh, my first morning back, like back in Canada, I literally ran to the window and was like, <gasps> Oh my god, like oh my god, I'm home. Like you just there's an immense amount of gratitude when your foot steps off that plane and there's this lineup of people there to shake your hands and welcome you back home. It's it's intense. Um and I'm not sure if there's really like a perfect way of dialing it back down. I think a lot of times you just you carry on with uh, with work, with life, I surrounded myself with family um, because it, you know, I I didn't understand their stress for me being away and not knowing what was going on, kind of thing. So, uh, just I don't think I did anything specific to transition back. There was still that, like I I missed it. I loved it. I had a, you know, a, a positive experience to some degree, but I, uh, I find for myself, it's, it's connection with people and connection with like other military, other veterans, um, that has helped me, uh, more now than it did back then. It sounds like your career, you know, had a number of challenges in it. And I'm very curious whether or not you ever experienced challenges related to being a woman in the military. I know there are times where I struggled um, being a woman. And, I, and, I, and a lot of times I just deduced it to that specific human is not a good human. Um, I, like one, at one point in my career, I had a sergeant tell me that Oh, you're not as you're not as bad as I thought you'd be considering you're female, you're blonde and you're a medic. And I was like, oh my God. And I and I remember just like I was like, what? And I looked around because it wasn't just me and him. Like it wasn't like a slide or anything. But I looked around and and everybody's faces said it all. And I was like, I don't even need I don't need to point out how inappropriate that was. Um but the women I've met in the military are like, they're my heroes. Like I look at them and I think, wow. And, and I, I, something I would probably suggest for women uh, would be to not minimize the great things that you do in your career or for your family and, and not minimize the, the, the crappy things that have happened. And, 
Um, and there are resources out there. They are somewhat uh, difficult to access, but they are there. And, uh, and that's something I had to admit to myself that I needed help. And eating clean and exercising and sleeping was my limitation of what I could do to help myself. So um, there's, there's always the stigma of seeking mental health providers, but um, being vulnerable in doing that creates strength and growth and, uh, and has helped me tremendously. I think there's so much wisdom in what you said about allowing yourself to be vulnerable in service of your mental health. I'd like to stay on the topic of your transition back to civilian life, if we could. Am I right in understanding that you joined True Patriot Love on one of their expeditions? I did. I did. I am forever grateful to TPO. Um, I had a few friends like Marianne Barber. She'd been on previous um, expeditions and most people know Marianne. <laughs> yeah. And she had, uh, she had sent me the link and I had seen her expedition and I had another friend that I was in Afghanistan with in 2008 and 2010, actually. She had sent it and said, Matt, I think this is totally up your alley. And it was the all women's expedition to the Arctic out to Baffin Island. And I thought, well, I'm not a fan of the cold, but um, I'll just apply for it. And then I'm presuming there's going to be a plethora of people applying for it. And at least they'll have seen my name. So hopefully eventually I'll get one or get an expedition. And so I got a call from Jill and, and did the interview. And I still was like, am I on? I don't know. And so I, I was one of the lucky ones to be able to do the all women's expedition. And, uh, and I remember like our first meeting, we had uh, flown out to Gravenhurst, Ontario, uh, to do like our, our like first meet with all the women and all the expeditioners. And that like my original intentions um, for TPL was like me having moved back to Saskatchewan, I was living back with my parents in a small town. I, I found it really easy to isolate myself. And so I do my job, I treat my clients, and then I would go home and isolate. And it was easy and nobody even noticed because there's not anything to do in my hometown. So I, uh, I, wanted to connect with other veterans, but because Saskatchewan's so vast and tiny little population populations, there's limited veterans there. So I wanted to get involved with veterans, helping veterans in any way I could. And when I had multiple people mention TPL in the expedition, I thought, why not? I'll start somewhere. And uh, it led me to um, to where I am now. And for our listeners who might not be familiar with True Patriot Love and their expeditions, could you just describe what their purpose is? So True, the True Patriot Love Foundation is a nonprofit organization that helps support um, different veteran and family affiliated programs across Canada. And so the expedition itself uh, it was essentially a fundraiser uh, to help fund the TPL um, and their initiatives. So, but the, the really cool thing that I loved about it was that it was teaming up veterans with business people. And, and I didn't understand at first what, what was, it was all going to entail until we had our first meet and we had a fireside chat where we went around the room and um, explained why we were doing this expedition. And myself and all the other female military veterans um, were all in tears because there was these very prominent, um, distinguished women that were, you know, distinguished business women as well that made it up in ranks um, that were intrigued with what we were doing and I'd I'd always considered myself 
you know, I minimize the great things and minimize the, the crappy things as well, where, you know, when we talk about our experiences, they would just be in awe. And I was like, okay, <laughs> maybe, maybe there's more to it. And I'm, I'm not giving myself credit for, um, for the things I've done. And they were really, um, really great at bringing that out. So we had done this first meet, you kind of get to pick some mentors that you'd like to work with. And a few months go past, you do your training. So I was dragging tires in my hometown and uh, doing whatever physical activities I could do because I was worried about the trek being 100 kilometers. I didn't want, I didn't want to be holding anyone back. So I, uh, a few months went by. So April 1st of last year, we flew out to Ottawa um, to meet with the team. We got all our dry food, set up all our equipment, and then flew out to Iqaluit, um, where we we got stuck. <clears throat> excuse me. We got stuck in Iqaluit because of some conference. So there was no room and board anywhere. And random... Um, coincidence our doctor knew of a couple military guys that were stationed there so they had military barracks that were completely available so they came and picked us up in like their arctic vehicles gave us some a, a little tour of the area set us up in our accommodation like it, it was like one of those unforeseen um this is what the military does for the military and like everyone was super grateful because otherwise we were sleeping on an airport floor. Um, and then the next day we flew out, um, we ended up in Kik Tarjwak, which is a small community um, on the northern part of the Aotuk Passage that we were going to be doing. So um, we did our little spiel to understand how to act and, and certain things to know about the passage and then stepped off uh, the following day. So we spent nine days in the Arctic doing like 10 to 20 kilometers a day by snowshoe for the first 60K and then ice picks for the, the, the last 40. And so it was, it was awesome. <laughs> it, what it was an different. adventure. Yeah, because my, my field experience, especially sleeping in a tent in the snow, was always military. And here I was in a tent full of women, so it smelt nice. You know, there's the courtesy, of, you know. And uh, I had just such an incredible group of women. And, and so we had our little pods. So the women, like my business mentors, were in my tent with one of our guides and then one of the TPL ladies. And uh, so we just got to know each other, like, because we spent, other than the six, seven hours of walking, the rest of the day was set up for food because we had to boil our water. We had to, you know, cook our, our dry food meals kind of thing. So it was, uh, it was, it was impressive. It was cold. It was a challenge, but um, the women we went with like all made it through and all made it through as, as a team. So that piece of the military where you kind of, you follow through with the team as a team um, was there, but <clears throat> the niceties of, you know, Chanel number five in the morning kind of thing. So, yeah. And, and like, how did this experience change you? It just sounds incredible. Well, for me, it was, for me, I would say it was life changing because I reconnected with other military and other veterans i also was doing a purpose like i was following a purpose that was near and dear to my heart that i'd spent my entire adult life doing and that i knew was missing when i was at home in saskatchewan so and then the questions the women would ask in my tent and they'd be like oh my god oh my and i was just like i oh, okay like I, I would have never, I saw it as just a normal everyday thing because those crappy things that happen are you, you're as a team, you kind of, you swallow that, you know, the discomfort or the, the shock and you just follow through all the time. So I never stopped and actually assessed myself as having done great things or I just thought I was just doing what I was supposed to do. Right. So it gave me, 
it, it helped me find my voice and understand that um, that there there is progression and growth, and it's possible to to move past like the the struggles and uh, and for me it wasn't necessarily like like pain or because I got medically released for my knee, but I I knew once I was done in the military and done my vocational rehab that um, like I wasn't right. And I looked around and I was like, well, I have my family, I have friends, like I have no reason to not be happy. And then, you know, days go by, days go by and it's, it's a struggle, like very internal where it's a weight and it's a painful weight. And it, it, you, you don't understand or recognize why it's there. So it was like that constant, um, um, uh, it's like a deep, heavy, empty pain. And so I, I was struggling with that. And then I, TPL happened and I, I allowed myself to be vulnerable. I allowed myself to be part of the team again. And, and they were inspiring to me in the sense that they made me feel like you you did great things and they reiterated that. And, uh, it, it allowed me to have the courage to move forward. And that's where I decided to move to Edmonton where there is a larger veteran population and, um, the, the veterans that I have met that connection is, is very healing for me anyways. It almost sounds like a perfect moment of closure to a specific chapter of your life. Yeah, very much so. And so where has life taken you since? So, uh, so I currently live in Fort Saskatchewan. So I moved to the Edmonton area uh, a little over a year ago in order to pursue um, creating an integrated health clinic to help veterans uh, whether they're struggling with their mental health, whether that's there's social services that they require, um, but to be a bit of the gateway helping them through, uh, whether that's navigating the medical system or veterans affairs or being a, a form of support um, that understands what military, um, the majority of military people go through. So. I moved out here, yeah, a little over a year ago. And so I'm collaborating with uh, another group of, uh, they're not all veterans, but they're military focused. And so we're just in the process right now of uh, finalizing a purchase of a clinic so that we can start um, implementing uh, social services, medical services, and we're also uh, implementing a platform that helps essentially unite your, you know, if, if you have a homeless veteran, you can treat their medical issues, but they won't get better if they don't have house, food, um, fam- like or friendship or, or something, right? So this platform helps connect your medical personnel with those other entities and services so that you're looking at your patient or your client um, as a whole and not just for their blood work or your physical findings. So just a small step towards helping veterans and their families. It sounds very meaningful and in many ways like your journey is coming full circle. I had this deep-seated purpose that I I needed veterans um, in the sense for my own mental health and that I have a unique uh, perspective because I I am a veteran myself and I do struggle with anxiety and depression. Um, But I also had to find how to get help. And so I, for me, it it is full circle because I'm, I'm a medical personnel helping veterans um, in my latter part of my life, whereas 
my entire adult life from 18 to 32, 33 was um, being a military person, helping military people. So, yeah, I, I love it. It's, it's complicated and uh, I learn every day because the medical system on the civilian side is much different than that of the military side. I love that you have been able to find a way to continue serving your country and fellow veterans, but this time as a civilian. TPL and other um, foundations that are helping veterans um, give those opportunities for, for growth and purpose and it's fulfilling and there's still that, that you're helping the team whether they're serving or not, right? Well, Natalie, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. You have a beautiful story and you share it so eloquently. Thank you for being our guest for the last episode of the second season of For Her Country. It's been an honor to have you. Thank you. Thank you guys for doing this. This is, uh, this is incredible. And that's a wrap for season two of For Her Country. Thank you for joining us on this amazing journey and for learning about the Canadian Armed Forces with us and for getting to know some of these incredible female trailblazers. We hope that these conversations in leading change and overcoming adversity have inspired you to look for ways to make improvements in your own organizations and in your own lives. And you can stay connected with the For Her Country podcast by joining our our Facebook group and following the LinkedIn showcase page. Simply visit True Patriot Love Foundation's Facebook page and click groups or the foundation's LinkedIn page where you'll find the affiliated For Her Country page. Links to both pages can be found in this episode's description at forhercountry.ca. For Her Country is hosted by me, Shannon Busta. It is written and produced by me and Katrina Bolak. Our music is by Whiskey Wolf and Oceanic Piano. A special thank you to Catherine Rusk and the Goddard family and the team at True Patriot Love for their support throughout this project. This project was produced with the True Patriot Love Foundation and the Captain Nicola Goddard Fund. True Patriot Love is Canada's leading organization that supports military members and their families. It administers the Captain Nicola Goddard Fund, which was started by the Goddard family to support women in the military in honor of Nicola. To learn more about this podcast and the great work of this organization, please visit forhercountry.ca and consider donating if you can.